Awesome. So anyways, I'm James, and this is my coworker, Ethan. Um, we're here to talk to you about malvertising and generally the ad ecosystem and you know things related to that, that topic. So real quick, we'll go over the agenda. It's going to be fairly brief. Um, we're going to try to finish up you know, on time. And the important thing is we're going to have some interactive part of the session. Uh, so if you guys have questions or anything like that, feel free, you know, interrupt. By all means, go, go ahead and do that. So the first thing we're going to do is kind of figure out, you know, what, what the audience looks like. We're going to talk a little bit about ourselves, uh, you know, and our company as well. Um, the other thing we're going to do is, you know, go into uh, the history and evolution of the ad ecosystem. You know, this is a really complex thing. Most people are not very familiar with it, and they haven't worked with it if they didn't come out of the ad space. So, you know, the most interesting part is probably going to be part of this. We're going to briefly go over how you can utilize this potentially in some of the pen tests, and we're going to go over how it's actually been used by bad guys uh, to kind of subvert the trust and things like that of users. So, without any, you know, further ado, you know, where does everyone come from? Uh, I, I'm I'm going to ask for a raise of hands on these questions. So. Uh, like who's an incident responder or something like that? Um, so there's a few IR folks. Um, what about pen testers? How many how many people here are pen testers? Awesome, yeah, good to see. Are there any anti-abuse people here by any chance? No, no ISPs. Not not surprising. Are there any uh, actual full-time developers? That's actually really awesome. I'm glad to see that turn out. Um, and then are there any people here from like ad ops or anything like that? Not, not surprising at all. <laughs> I, I am not shocked. Uh, so it's, it's interesting because the most interesting things to you guys is probably going to be how do I subvert the ad ecosystem to actually, you know, help me with my pen test? How do I use this to gather information or target users? Um, so, you know, we're going to kind of briefly go into that. We're going to have an interactive session on that after we kind of go over the ecosystem and give you guys an overview of what everything looks like. So, further question, who here has actually observed a mal malvertisement? Who here knows what a malvertisement is? Okay, so that's the other half. <laughs> if you guys haven't seen it, it, you know, a lot of times you've been affected by it. Either your, you know, parents, stuff like that, uh, have, have observed it, you know, but I think that everyone in here has pretty much been touched by malvertising at some point. Um, who here works for a company that displays ads on their websites? So not a huge amount of folks. Um, who here runs an ad blocker? <laughs> That's pretty funny. I, it, it's interesting to see the uh, difference in, in folks. Um, who here knows what a SSP or DSP or anything like that means? It's, it's all gibberish. <laughs> okay. So anyways, about me. Uh, I've asked a bunch of questions and, you know, uh, who here hasn't raised their hand? Oh, man. That guy right over there. <laughs> so I've been doing InfoSec for a while now. It's been my full-time job for the last 10 years. Um, you know, I've worked at a ton of different places. I've, you know, worked everything from a small hosting provider uh, where we had, you know, maybe 200 customers to Fortune 100s. And I've seen pretty much everything that you could see in that time period. I've done everything from reverse engineering to actually dealing with network security uh, inside a corporation, you know, trying to get them on the right path. Um, right now, I work over at Risk IQ. Thank, thank them for allowing me to actually come out here and speak to you guys. Um, and what I do is I, I run the research organization. So what we do is we do a lot of research into these sorts of topics. Um, you know, we focus a lot on anti-malvertising, malware, things like that. So we do a lot of detection on that. We see a ton of stuff just based off of what our customers send us. You know, we have a lot of really big customers, and we'll kind of uh, briefly go over the types of customers that we have. Um, 
my freaking favorite font is Comic Sans. I love that font. I, I love it almost as much as Clippy, which is to say that I freaking hate them both. <laughs> um, you know, it, I love beer. It loves me back. I, I mean, <laughs> uh, so, so I kind of fit in with, with our group, you know, here in, uh, you know, InfoSec. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Ethan and let him kind of talk about himself as well. All right. Thank you, James. Good to see everybody. Um, so yeah, so uh, I come, I have a bit of a different background. I actually come from the ads world. So I've been doing ad stuff for about seven years and in the last four years or so I've been uh, at Risk IQ kind of blending my knowledge of the ad ecosystem with security, fraud, and and helping uh, helping different folks in the industry solve some some pretty tough problems. Um, I'm kind of a startup guy. I've worked at a variety of startups, uh, done my own, um, and currently I'm kind of laser focused on the the product sales and delivery of our anti malvertising and other uh, ads related solutions. So we thought we'd get a head of research and the business together and give you guys more of a kind of full 360 view of, of what's going on in the industry. All right, so a little quick background on Risk IQ. Um, we, uh, we have two main product areas, but we're, we're really going to be focused on anti-malvertising today. Uh, the key thing with this slide here is, that, um, is to give you guys a very broad understanding of the technology at a high level. So we are operating, uh, operating a global, um, a covert global uh, crawling infrastructure. The key is that when we crawl the internet, pages, ads, mobile apps, et cetera, that we're mimicking a real user, real user session, experiencing the content on the page or the ad exactly the way that a real user would. Um, this includes native JavaScript instrumentation, executing all the resources. And the whole point here is that uh, a criminal or an attacker should not be able to tell the difference between our virtual user and a normal human being. So this is not um, an invasive uh, type of scan. This is more of we're mimicking a real user. It's a threat scan to see if our virtual users get infected by storing, uh, doing full DOM capture and um, looking at all the resulting behaviors and scoring them. Um, in terms of uh, ads, uh, we work with three of the top five exchanges in the world. So we've hit a certain amount of scale where we're seeing a good portion of all of the ads um, across the entire internet. And it, it gives us kind of a unique lens um, and interesting data um, in order to, uh, to kind of move forward and kind of where we're at with this, with this issue. So uh, this is a part of the presentation. We're just going to give a, a brief kind of history, an evolution of the ad e ecosystem itself. Um, just as a just as kind of a highlight, how do, how do, what are the different types of ads that are in the ecosystem? Uh, you can see search uh, definitely dominates, and that's, um, that's probably not a shocker to anybody. But uh, you'll notice that display is probably the, the second largest, and mobile is aggressively uh, catching up. Um, these stats are a couple years old, but it kind of shows the trend of the industry and, and really how big the industry is. So the reason we want to sh talk about revenue models for a moment is because the type of uh, fraud or threats, uh, security issues kind of relate to the different types of economic models of how people make money uh, on the internet with advertising. Um, so we have uh, CPM, which stands for uh, cost per thousand impressions. This is really the display industry. This is a 300 by 250 banner ad or a leaderboard banner that you'll see as you browse the internet. Uh, CPA, also commonly referred to as affiliate, stands for cost per action. And so this is when an advertiser only pays once an action has been taken, whether it be filling out a form, signing up, uh, buy, the user buys something. Um, the, the money only exchanges hands when the action is taken. Uh, and then lastly, uh, CPC, or cost per click, or pay per click, uh, and that obviously is, you know, the advertiser pays when a user clicks on something. Okay, so let's go back in time. Let's go back to the 90s, the, the early mid-90s. 
Who who here uh, had computers and internet like back in the nineties? Every, everyone, uh, like everyone here, it's really interesting crowd because I think everyone's kind of on, on the edge of that. So, uh, you guys remember all the freaking blink ads? And, like, click here, you've won. That that's this stuff. So I'll I'll hand it back over. Sorry. <laughs> so like back in the day. Basically, uh, you know, and somebody wanted to advertise on a website, figure out a way to get a hold of the publisher, call them up, say, hey, we want to advertise. Here's a piece of code. Put it on your site. Let's figure out a deal. And it was very um, kind of off the cuff. There was not a lot of structure. There wasn't, there wasn't really, it wasn't really much complicated more than that. It was kind of a one-to-one -one type of relationship. Um, as time went on, more publishers popped up, more advertisers popped up, this internet thing started to take off. What's a publisher? And a, a publisher, uh, the definition of a publisher really is just a website that earns money by serving ads against its users. So uh, that's, what I, that's what I mean when I say the word publisher, a website. So yeah, this internet thing started to take off, more people are popping up. And so we kind of have the invention of uh, an ad server. Um, you know, the first kind of big ad server that kind of took the industry by storm was DoubleClick. So this started back in 1996. And, uh, you know, basically as a publisher or as a website owner, um, I have space on my website where I can sell advertising. Right? We call that uh, inventory. And so I have a certain let's call it real estate, this inventory that I can sell. And so, but I have multiple advertisers that all want to give me money to put their ad in my, uh, what's it called, on my, my real estate. And so the invention of an ad server was basically like, well, we're going to take all these different advertisers, all these different uh, ads, and then basically place them on your site. We're going to do analytics and tracking and see how many impressions and clicks and kind of started to create the infrastructure to allow um, really the website owner to start to maximize the money that they made. And, and also what, what's really important here, and Ethan briefly touched on it, was the analytics. Um, this is laying the foundation and the groundwork for some of these interesting business models. We talked about CPC. Uh, how, do you, uh, how do you know that something got clicked without having tracking infrastructure, knowing you know, where the client came from, you know, how do you do that? And this model basically allowed for these new types of advertising uh, revenue to come in, uh, so. <clears throat> so as we have ad servers that pop up, an interesting, start, uh, an interesting thing starts to happen. Uh, suddenly, there's all these publishers, there's all these um, advertisers and if you start to look at the internet and you realize that there's vertical specific content there's specific buckets of users that are interested in certain types of um, of content and so uh, ad networks were basically invented as a way to say hey I'm going to go out there and roll up every website that does credit card uh, that talks about credit cards and credit card comparisons. And I'm going to roll up all these websites where I have now all of this, this inventory of ads to sell, and then I'm going to go to advertisers and I'm going to offer them more scale. You can reach more users that are visiting credit card sites. And so uh, the networks themselves, they become brokers, middlemen uh, that are aggregating both sides of the equation um, to offer more scale and more specific targeting um, to an advertiser. And then moving forward, getting closer to today, we have the concept of an ad exchange. So an ad exchange, similar to a network, but this is where it starts to become more like Wall Street and the stock market. Now there's, there's an explosion of so many people that want to buy ads and so many website owners or publishers that want to make money from ads that it actually makes sense to have an auction model where your auction, the, instead of buying and selling you know, one share of Apple, you're buying and selling the impression on a website, that 300 by 250 uh, inventory. And so but this is what, what this basically created uh, was a lot of liquidity, a lot of scale, 
and a model where anybody could start to bid in real time um, in a kind of closed auction environment uh, in order to win the auction and serve the ad to that specific user at that specific time. And so uh, that this, that's what an ad exchange is. So there's a problem. The problem is, is that advertisers have different needs uh, than publishers. Advertisers want to <coughs> reach more people, they want to pay less money for more inventory, et cetera. And publishers want to maximize the amount of money they make um, for less inventory. They want to charge more per impression. Um, and on top of that, there's, all, there's multiple exchanges. So there's a lot of complexity here and it, it's, it get, starts to get a little confusing. And so a few things, and James touched on this at the beginning of, of the presentation, does anybody know what a DSP or an SSP is? And so enter the DSP. So the DSP is an advertiser solution. It's basically a technology platform that in, it stands for demand side platform. Uh, so uh, think of the analogy I like to use here is that if you're gonna go back to Wall Street, if you're gonna buy, I don't know, a share of Apple, you're gonna go on E-Trade, you're gonna put in, a buy a share at this limit price, you hit the buy button. And then E-Trade goes out and actually does the transaction for you. That's basically more or less what a DSP does in the advertising ecosystem. So you have, let's just say Ford, and let's say they want to spend $200 million on internet advertising this year. Their, agency, their ad agency or their trading desk is going to use some type of technology that's going to start making those buys, making those trades. And a DSP is basically that technology platform, that stack that integrates with all the different exchanges and basically bids on ad inventory, bids on users. On the publisher side, we have something called an SSP, and this stands for supply side platform. <coughs> so right, the demand for, uh, for users and the supply of users, or the demand for inventory and the supply of, of inventory. And so the SSP was uh, invented to help the publisher the, or the website owner maximize uh, their, uh, the money they make from ads. It's also been referred to as yield optimization. Again, you have multiple exchanges, you have multiple uh, agencies, buyers. The scale is enormous. How do you centralize it all and make sure that the publisher is selling that ad at that time for the highest amount? And so an SSP uh, basically sits between a publisher and the various ad exchanges uh, representing um, the website owner's inventory and their, their users uh, to be sold to the highest bidder. All this comes together into a very complicated slide that tries to kind of show how it all fits together where we have, if you imagine the actual end users, uh, we would be at the very far right uh, in the publishers or the website owners. <coughs> and you see it kind of the ad servers, supply side platforms hook into the exchanges and the networks that are in the middle, which hook into the demand side platforms, agencies, and ultimately the advertisers or the, the marketers as uh, this slide refers to it. So it's a, it's a very complex ecosystem with a lot of layers. And the layers themselves is one of the reasons why criminals uh, or the attackers really like this ecosystem. It is very attractive. Why? Number one, scale. Advertising basically reaches everybody. We're talking about billions of, of users or devices if you think about it globally. Uh, the economics are cheap. The cost to purchase a thousand, to get your ad in front of a thousand, uh, thousand users, a thousand impressions, could be anywhere around 20 cents. And if you're, as James is gonna get into as the next part of this presentation, if you're using the ad as a vehicle to distribute malware or an exploit, that is a very cheap way to infect people. Um, three, targeting. We all know how extreme, <laughs> how advertising pushes the boundaries of privacy and targeting, personalizing the ads. We're going to get into retargeting later. All of these targeting options that were built for legitimate purposes for advertisers to do a, to do a better job, it's perfect for criminals as well. Now they can basically target very specific users. Uh, and again, we're going to get into that a little bit, a little bit later. 
Um, and, the, and the last thing I want to touch on is that the complexity of the system, this is actually a very simple diagram. One, the delivery of one ad could actually go through 30, 50, 75 different redirects, different hops from the actual advertiser to the actual publisher. And so that level of complexity actually helps criminals mask their identity or obfuscate who they are, hide between other brokers, other middlemen, and allows them to uh, keep their malware, malware campaigns running longer. Uh, so hopefully, you know, this gives you more of a background of kind of how the industry functions, uh, what all the pieces do, and kind of, kind of where we're at today. Uh, and now I'm going to hand it back to James, and, and he's going to take us to the next part of the presentation. So Ethan kind of touched on this, but one of the interesting things that you get with advertising is, and, and this has huge privacy implications as well, um, there's been a lot of discussion on it lately, but basically your idea as an advertiser is you want to spend your money wisely. You know, uh, putting a display ad in front of a million people that are never going to use your product or something like that is never going to, to yield you any results. It's like advertising for a food uh, truck in, you know, uh, another country that you don't even do business in. It's a complete waste of time. I mean, you get on TV and things like that, and you see these advertisements for companies that aren't even in your area. And you're like, why are they even wasting money to put that in my face? So with web advertising, you actually get this really unique opportunity to figure out what sort of websites the user has been to, uh, what sort of interest they are. You can figure out potentially what their age range is, things like that. And really what it gives you the option to do is say, you know, if you're targeting retirees, you know, for some sort of fund or something like that, or an insurance benefit, or let's say like reverse mortgages or something like that, you know, you're not going to want to target an 18 year old kid that, you know, is 40 years away from retiring. You know, you're going to want to target people that are in their 50s, 60s, stuff like that. And what's really interesting is when you think about all these targeting options, there's completely legitimate uses, but it becomes a really interesting platform to target people with malware. You can now say, let's target only people that are you know, 50 or 60 because they're probably gonna have more money than somebody that's an 18 year old. You know, it, it, they're probably not gonna be patched. You know, they're, running, they're not running ad blockers like everyone in this room. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and, and stuff like that. You may want to target different users for different products. And, you know, that's, that's where retargeting really becomes interesting. Um, you know, just an example of this. So if a user goes to a car review website and they're looking for reviews on a specific model, a lot of times they can, you know, basically retarget that user at a later date. They, you know, it put a pixel or, you know, tracking cookie or something like that on the user. And then at a later date, they can start targeting that user, you know, when they're viewing, you know, Amazon or other random websites, and they start inundating them with ads for cars. You know, the other car dealers might say, oh, this person went to a Ford website let me start targeting them with Chrysler ads. You know, let's try to convert that into, you know, an actual sale or something like that. Um, you know, and basically, it's really interesting because retargeting allows you as a publisher to actually sell that impression for a lot more money. So the more information you know about your users and the more information you can give to advertisers, the more you can sell that impression. Because instead of paying 20 cents, for a thousand impressions, you might pay 20 cents for a specific user. If it's a user that's been, you know, looking at their credit and trying to figure out how to fix their credit, you might be able to sell that ad for 20 cents instead of, you know, uh, half a penny. Uh, so it's really interesting. You know, back to our car example, there's advertisers that all they do is focus on specific areas of, uh, of sales. You know, this is an ad agency that all they do is buy and sell inventory for car ads. 
you know, they're on major, you know, car review websites, and then they use Google Ads and other things inside the exchange to figure out where to sell their at inventory at. So it's kind of interesting, you know. And if you guys did run ads, which you probably won't, <laughs> not after this talk, um, you know, if you started searching for like an F one hundred and fifty and started going to websites, uh, you know, related to cars what's going to happen is you're just going to see tons and tons of ads related to cars. And this is retargeting at work. So now we've talked about the ecosystem and, you know, at a 10,000 foot view. Uh, this is an interesting thing. We've got a lot of pen testers in the room. How would you guys subvert this system? This is a, this is a question for the audience. Uh, and, and there is a microphone there. I'm going to start calling people randomly in the audience if, you, if we don't get some people. All right, you back there. I, I'm looking at you, yeah? You shook your head. What would you do? Yep. And we see that actually. We we see a ton of fraud. So basically, what he said is, you know, it, if I'm a competitor, I'm going to cause them to spend so much money and exhaust their their advertising campaign, and spend all of their money before they actually get real legitimate impressions. So it's it's a really interesting thing. So that's that's one way uh, to kind of subvert the the thing if you're working for you know a, a company that has competition. Um, how about you? In a green shirt. <laughs> no? Okay. Yellow. Oh, we're getting passed up. Very sad. So, anyways, the, there's a lot of really interesting things. Um, you can basically, you know, I, I ran an ad campaign earlier today, and what I did was I targeted people that I would think that are at this conver uh, conference. Um, you know, I basically said, you know, I'm going to target only people in San Francisco that are within a 10 mile, you know, area of uh, San Francisco. People that have had interest in security websites or, you know, consider themselves hackers or uh, stuff like that. You know, uh, areas of study where they've been to school for like risk management or security and stuff like that. Um, and generally are under 30. You know, our, our industry is fairly young. So being able to kind of target on a very specific group of users, you know, I can target people to potentially come to the talk. I mean, you know, people are getting bored on, you know, whatever websites, and all of a sudden, you know, something comes up related to AppSec. So it's very interesting because you can get into very specific audiences. Now, if you are going after people's retirement funds, wouldn't this be a great way to kind of weed weed out, you know, people that don't have money? I mean, do you want to go after somebody that's between 18 and 30? Or do you want to go after somebody that's, you know, 50 or 60 that might not know computers? You know, you're going to be able to run more effective malware campaigns using this infrastructure and using all the data that they've already collected. Um, and, and this is why there's a lot of serious privacy and security implications on this stuff. I mean, being able to target somebody like this, there's a lot of security stuff. Uh, you know, if you're a nation state, you could say, let me target people in Washington, D.C. that are, you know, 40, 50 years old. And boom, all of a sudden you can start targeting their home computers. Let's, let's say, you know, there, there's a category for government jobs or websites that have been related to government you know, websites, you could then start targeting these people while they're at home. It's a scary thought. I mean, it, it, it's a serious concern. And it's happening right now. People don't understand it, but this stuff is happening. It's happening today. It's going to happen tomorrow. Um, and part of that problem, yeah. Yeah. So this was through a social media network. Um, you know, people give their information out. 
Yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm not going to call out specific people or anything like that um, because there are legitimate uses for this. Um, there's a lot of platforms that are more restrictive than others. Facebook is actually pretty restrictive. Uh, over the years, they've increased the amount of privacy. You used to be able to target by like slash 32. So you used to be able to target one IP address inside some of these uh, platforms. I used to mess with coworkers like all the time. I'd put an ad for our NAT export, like our, our NAT address that came out of the internet. And I just, I'd, I'd target like one of my coworkers and I'd be like, Dave, get back to work. <laughs> Stop looking at Facebook. <laughs> um, you know, but it, it, it's really funny. You can figure out like what sites they're, they're commonly going to and, and kind of throw some interesting ads uh, for, for those folks. So, you know, there's a lot of legitimate things, but there's a lot of security uh, and privacy concerns with this. Um, you know, what's really interesting is the industry, uh, and, and Ethan can kind of, you know, talk about this a little more, but, you know, their primary focus for the last 15, 20 years has been the security of putting an ad in front of a user. They weren't really concerned about the user, they were concerned about their income. So one of the things they were concerned about was somebody defrauding them. They were concerned about hackers stealing money off of fraudulent clicks and things like that. Um, you know, they, their thought on the whole thing was, it's better for me to show a crappy ad than it is for me to not show an ad at all. Because even if I show a terrible ad, it's gonna give me money versus if I don't display an ad, I don't make any money at all. Um, you know, and honestly, until over the last like three or four years, these ad companies really, they didn't care about the users. Their, people weren't talking about the privacy implications of this stuff. They weren't talking about the issues that existed inside this ecosystem. And as you can see from the earlier slides, this entire thing is just this giant, complicated, you know, monster of, of an ecosystem. It's, it's crazy. Um, and, and with all of those things combined, when you have 10 different companies working on, you know, uh, what this delivery of one single ad, when there's 10 different companies involved, you know, it's hard enough getting one company secure. If you can imagine getting 10 of them secure and all of them to the same standards, um, <laughs> good luck. Uh, that, I mean, it, it becomes a problem. So, questions, yeah. I think a, a good analogy is what the gentleman over here mentioned earlier about uh, writing a bot that's going to go and click on a competitor's ads as an example. So on, on one, you have the advertisers that are fueling all the money into the ecosystem. So they get, they're a victim and they're adding all the money in. So that's why that's where the primary focus was. It was more of, hey, let's protect the supply of money, not let's protect the end user. And so now, what James is mentioning is because of the explosion of programmatic and RTB and auctions, because it's, it's like high frequency trading on Wall Street, what happened over the last you know, five, seven years, the scale and the complexity has just made it so attractive um, for, for criminals to start focusing on this area as a distribution vehicle. Hopefully that answered your question. Good? So there's entire companies that all they do is prevent fraud inside of, you know, the ad ecosystem. You know, there's, there's companies that all they do is try to identify bots uh, because there's been some huge botnets actually, um, you know, like uh, DNS changer, one of their primary ways of actually monetizing that was they would rewrite people's advertisements. So they would steal ad revenue from other people through an infected client. And, you know, it was a huge thing. They were making like millions and millions of dollars 
uh, off of this whole thing. I think by the time they said everything was said and done, it was like five or ten million dollars like per quarter. I mean, it was ridiculous amounts of money. I, I'm probably not going to go into that much further. Uh, by all means, uh, if anyone has questions on that stuff, uh, you know, you you can come up afterwards. Um, but back to the whole malvertising thing, you know, uh, this became a huge problem. You know, there was this explosive growth in ad revenue as well as other things. Uh, and basically, in 2005 and 2006, I would say that was like the year of malvertisements. You know, this, this term really became popular. It came about, people started actually looking at it. Um, you know, the problem was, before then, people didn't really understand where these infections were coming from. Um, you know, they started getting better monitoring. They started figuring out, you know, how all this stuff worked, and they were able to start identifying it more. It was happening, you know, way before then. Some, you know, some ad adware networks or you know adware programs, they they would run exploits on people's websites through ads, and people didn't understand where they were coming from, so they just didn't attribute it towards that stuff. Um, you know. Uh, again, you know, spyware and adware was probably some of the first folks to actually start utilizing this and capitalizing on it because they understood the ad network. These guys live and breathe ads, so they understood how to get their malware into people's boxes. So it's really interesting because we've gone from, you know, way back in the day where you would put an exploit on your website, send out a bunch of emails, and try to infect somebody, to now they almost run it as a traffic as a service sort of thing. You know, they, they've got, you know, tons of impressions and they basically say, hey, you know, I'm gonna sell you 50,000 display impressions and you pay, you know, 50 cents or 80 cents or whatever uh, per thousand. And, you know, you just kind of do that. So. People ask me all of all the time, what is malvertising? Like, what do you define that as? And to be completely honest, it's really simple. It is something that is malicious and it comes through an ad network. Um, anything, anywhere in the ad stream, I consider that a malvertisement. If it's something that I don't want to remove from my parents' computer, I consider that malware. Um, you know, if it's, if it's sending your private data and installing random executables from the internet, I don't think they have me in mind when they uh, when they were doing that. So, you know, we're talking about you know your really bad stuff, so info stealers, you know, Trojans, stuff like that. Um, and, and I also consider a lot of the adware and spyware stuff uh, to be malware as well. So, basically, on this slide, anything left of the ad server. Um, is is going to be malvertising in my in my opinion. Um, you know, why is this a problem? I, I'm sure everyone here understands why it's a problem, uh, but for other folks, like for the executives, it's it's like, you know, these guys have gotten away with real money. You know, it's to run these campaigns for the amount of of time and the amount of volume that they're doing, this is real money. Some of these guys are spending a hundred thousand dollars per month, a hundred grand per month on advertising. And and for you to spend a hundred grand per month means that you're probably making a million, two million dollars every single month off of this. I mean, there is real money that's being exchanged in this thing. You know. Organizations, they can't figure out where the hell this stuff came from. You know, with the ecosystem as complex as it is, if I gave you a chain of events that occurred for somebody to be, uh, you know, eventually have malware, I can almost guarantee you that most people in this room, hell, I would have a problem understanding what happened to lead up to that event. So, it, you know, it's a problem, and when Congress is talking about a problem, then you know it's actually been going on for a long time prior to that. 
I mean, for our government to actually recognize that this is a problem and this is a, a an issue with you know the internet, you know that that that's saying something. So, um, if you think about it, every big website uses ads. I mean, every single one. You know, in in some way, they're you know contributing towards this ecosystem. You know, at any point, if somebody compromises or subverts the trust inside any of these you know components, boom, you can get infected. They can start targeting your users. They can do whatever they want, you know, um, and it's a huge, huge market. They're saying that you know, like by 2018, it's going to be 660 billion dollars. Billion. It's ridiculous. There is there is so much money in this that. You know, even if 1% of that is fraud, it's still massive amounts of money that's being used. So, again, how big is this problem? So, I pulled the stat this morning uh, and just updated the slide. We've seen 670,000 bad ads since the start of this year. In the first quarter, we saw as many bad ads as the entire previous year. Think about that. I mean, that's like huge, huge numbers, and it's just increasing. Um, they're moving away from malware delivery towards scareware, scammy browser locker things uh, because it's easier, so much easier. And then, and then they don't have the risk. You know, they're just saying, well. You know, the user didn't know any better, and it's not as bad because we're not actually infecting them. Um, the percent, I don't have it off the top of my head, but when we actually started looking at percentages, um, it's like half a percent to a quarter of a percent. But when you think about how many display impressions there are, um, that's still a huge amount of traffic. You know, a quarter percent of trillions of impressions is still a huge amount of, of traffic. Um, any other questions so far? Yes? How are we? Um, so, as Ethan mentioned earlier, and I'm trying not to, you know, turn it into a sales pitch or anything like that. I I don't like seeing those talks, and I'm sure you guys don't either. Um, basically, what we have is we have our own crawler. It's our own browser. Um, you know, we've instrumented everything from you know the DOM, the JavaScript emulation, everything like that. So we can actually see specific things that change. So we'll see, you know, this advertising uh, JavaScript code added another iframe, and we know that that iframe, you know, basically came from this JavaScript, which means that there's some sort of relation. And we basically build hierarchies uh, of relationships between all of this, uh, all that stuff. And that's how we're able to like accurately say, um, you know, this came from this. I could, but I didn't. <laughs> um, you know, honestly, like the most common, just from my gut, I don't have the stats right now with me. Um, I can pull them up afterwards if you want to talk with me after. Um, but the majority are actually, you know, iframes inside of the website. So they're typical banner ads and things like that. But we've seen a huge migration towards mobile this year. Uh, mobile is probably going to account for like 50% of the bad ads um, by the end of this year. Um, you know, these guys are hitting mobile hard. Uh, and I've got a couple examples towards the end, you know, assuming everything's good on time. Okay. Any other question? So what they're doing is they're posing as, you know, fake ad networks or, you know, fake, you know, 
advertisers and stuff like that. And then they just say, hey, uh, I'm Ford Motor Company, except it's F-O-D-R, you know, instead of Ford. Uh, and that's how they're, it's a lot of social engineering. It's a, <clears throat> so they'll use mainly iframes. And so the source, like the source URL inside, and once the campaign's live, it's, they can change it at any time. And that's, that's really what the crux of the problem is. Yeah, one of, the, one of the big issues is basically there's no integrity checks on what was actually scanned is still the same thing as what's being displayed today. Um, there was some stuff that's kind of interesting with Firefox where they're um, adding uh, hash checks on external resources. Um, they were playing around with that. I'm not sure exactly where that, that went. Last time I talked to um, some of the Mozilla developers, um, they were playing with it, but I'm not sure if it ever got uh, released. But it also requires standard changes to allow you to basically hash uh, external resource and you know validate that inside the browser like that that would solve a lot of problems from my perspective if if we had that yeah um, so campaigns what's really interesting on campaigns and this is just a tidbit of kind of uh, uh, info is most of the ad operations folks, they work on Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And they're either on the East Coast or the West Coast uh, here in the U.S. for most ad companies. And what's really funny is a lot of these actors know that, so they'll run their campaign on Friday afternoon. And then they don't get addressed till Monday when, when folks come back. So kind of an interesting observation. I've seen that with a couple different uh, campaigns and you know, just kind of interesting. So anyways, um, to, the, to the malvertisement stuff, and, and I apologize that you know, this is going to be a little rushed. Uh, we're running a little short on time. Um, I can talk to anyone that's interested after this, uh, after this about this stuff, if, if you guys want. Um, you know, we have the ads. We've talked a ton about how the ads you know, get there, what they consist of, um, and basically, at any point in that chain, if they compromise it, boom, they can stick malware or you know fraudulent pop-ups and you know all sorts of nasty crap in there. Um, typically, what they do is they you know put a iframe or script tag that redirects to a traffic distribution system. And like I was mentioning earlier, there's kind of this traffic as a service thing that that we see a lot of, and basically it's targeted towards you know, malicious users. You know, they'd say, hey, here's 15,000, you know, impressions or something like that. And you can put your, your exploit kit in there or whatever you want. And what they do is they redirect it, you know, to a bunch of, uh, you know, different exploit kits or scam campaigns and things like that. Basically, um, you know, a lot of this stuff kind of started uh, in the adult industry. They used to, like, trade traffic to each other. So if I put an iframe in my website and you put an iframe in, our, in your website, we both get impressions if a user goes to either one of the websites. And that's how they jack up their uh, rankings. You know, they do stuff like that to kind of, you know, say that they have more users than they actually do. Um, you know, sometimes they'll use it for cookie stuffing, so they'll do affiliate fraud uh, through that. And, you know, we can talk about that afterwards if anyone's interested in that. Um, but it, this component is one of the primary things they use to rotate between exploit kits. Um, here's a really stupid example of one, but basically, um, this is an admin page that I found. Um, and basically all it is is a rotator. It's a PHP script that they upload to a compromised website, uh, and it rotates between a bunch of URLs. And they'll sell that traffic and make money off of it. So exploit kits. I think most people probably know what an exploit kit is. Um, you know, everyone knows that uh, these things are used to, you know, exploit a browser without the user's interaction. You know, they own it and drop malware. Um, you know, some of the interesting things that we've seen trend is 
the exploit kits have become less effective because of all the layers of security in the software. So it's harder to, you know, exploit users as it was, you know, like in 2001, it was just like, boom, you know, pop everything. And now it's a little harder. So they're actually using more social engineering. You know, they're saying, they're subverting the trust of the users. They're saying, you need to update Flash, run this executable, um, your browser is locked, you know, blah, blah, blah. And this is how, you know, things are going uh, right now. Here's, here's an example, uh, and sorry, this was like, I just pulled it from a uh, adult site. Um, it's a common website. Uh, but basically, what happens is at the very end of this advertising campaign, um, there's this pop-up that shows up, and it basically says this. You have updates ready to install. And I'm sure everyone has told everyone uh, that they know their family, the people they love, you need to keep your software updated. You need to keep your software updated. What are they going to do when they see this? You know, they're going to go, oh, my software needs updating. Click, click, click. Done. And this is how they're getting uh, their software installed on things. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a hard, hard thing to solve. Uh, the other thing that we've seen a lot of is the mobile lockers. And we have this, like, awesome English uh, from Eastern Europe, you know, FBI, attention, actions performed are fixed. Like, what are you talking about? Uh, you know, they're basically saying, you know, you, you've seen uh, banned porn and you need to pay us money through, like, uh, Money Pack or, you know, some of these other things. So it, they've really kind of moved towards that. Um, and with that, I mean, I'll just kind of wrap up. Uh, you know, we're having the same problems with ads that we had 15 years ago with open mail servers that were just spamming everything. Um, you know, the companies are actually coming around to realizing that if they don't fix the problem, then the users will. Everyone's going to run ad blockers, and their revenue stream is going to go away. They're not going to make any money. Um, so they're kind of playing catch up. Um, you know, at least the smart ones are. Um, you know, there needs to be more verification around the ad buyers. We're, we were talking earlier on, uh, you know, how this whole thing needs to have trust. And the other thing is, you know, making sure that they're constantly scanning this stuff for, for malware because they change, you know, very rapidly. So last thing, we've got a long way to go. I mean, us as security practitioners, we need to help them move, move forward on that stuff. And, you know, it, it's a long road, but eventually we'll hopefully get it solved. Um, with that, um, well, first, is Robert Smith here in the room by any chance? Maybe? <laughs> Are you? Really? Y you won the uh, segue. <laughs> From from Intel, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, talk talk to us afterwards. Uh, you actually uh, won that uh, little cart, so that's awesome. I, I'm happy he's actually in the room. <laughs> well, that's great. Um, so, and we've got hardly any time. Uh, we've got one minute. So, any questions? Uh, briefly, yeah. Yes. There are. I can uh, exchange my card with you afterwards and kind of give you an idea of uh, the shady ones. So, um, and this is our contact info if anyone wants to uh, reach out to us afterwards. But thanks, thanks for everyone uh, coming to the talk.